Hey friends, it's Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this week's episode of The Underground. Well, I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, as you can all see, I now finally do have the long-awaited answer to prayer. I have a new studio. Uh, for those who have been tracking with The Underground, you know that over the past year, this has been, uh, it's been a prayer. It's been something that I've been working toward and waiting for. And I know many of you over the past year or so have even uh, donated toward getting a new studio. Uh, so I want to just give a few brief updates, and then I want to jump into a prophetic update. Uh, but about a year ago, my family and I moved to a different house, and in doing that, I gave up the, uh, the beloved uh, chicken coop, which was my previous TV studio that I used for the underground programs. Um, I always, you know, joked that I was able to run that whole thing with one extension cord coming off of the back of my house, and it was the old chicken coop that I had converted uh, into my my cramped but um, functional. Uh, and beloved little TV studio. But in moving over here to the house that we're in now, I had initially hoped that I could just put a small addition onto the house. Um, the city here won't allow us just to have a shed in the backyard. So that sort of a detached shed is not allowed. So I was going to do just a, a small addition. Um, and, you know, many of you had donated and I raised several thousand dollars for the studio. So that was a tremendous blessing. And um, I didn't feel like I was supposed to just keep, you know, trying to raise funds for that. Uh, but so in getting bids, uh, and I had several different folks come over and give bids, it was just, it was way out of the ballpark in terms of what I had budgeted and what I thought was reasonable. I mean, you know, a, a low bid was probably like $50,000, and it's not even a very big addition. Um, so I just said, you know, look, forget that. The economy's changing, you know, with Amazon, retail is closing, is hurting, retail stores are closing down and so forth. I said, why don't I just find a commercial space someplace that's relatively quiet to lease, uh, someplace close to my house. And so I started sort of hunting around, and I found a spot that I thought was just perfect, and I made a really incredibly low offer. Um, they came back, obviously, with a counter offer, to which I made another counter offer. And when the dust settled, all the negotiations were done. I've got an incredibly great deal um, on a space. And they actually, even after negotiating, and we worked out this price per month, actually, it's just a price per year, they said, well, not only that, but the space that you were looking at, which was, it was pretty big, it was much more than I need in terms of square footage. They said, um, someone's paying us to actually store some stuff there. Why don't you take this bigger spot over here? Um, so I have tons of space here. In fact, I could actually have um, small church services here. I mean, I can have Bible study gathering or this sort of thing, and I may even do that down the road. But anyway, all this to say is I'm blessed um, to finally have a dedicated space. Before, by the way, the past several months when I've been recording The Underground, I'm just sitting in my office, and a lot of people say, hey, I could care less where, where you are, you know, just do teaching. But the problem is, um, for anybody who works at home, you know how difficult that is because there's always something going on at home. But in my house, and this is what you none of you saw, is that I have these two incredibly annoying, loud dogs. And my office is right next to the front door. So every time a squirrel walks by the end of the street, they just would go nuts. And so I would sit there and try to find a time that was quiet, maybe after everybody went to bed, whatever. You know, I'd have to find very unique times to record. And inevitably, there would always be a couple times that the dogs would just start barking. And, and um, I would have to edit out the part with me, you know, wanting to kill the dogs and this sort of thing. So not really, but just going, ah, you know, so incredibly frustrating. So now I have a dedicated space. Um, the setup that I have right now, this is just temporary. I just threw up a few things. I'm sitting back in the saddle. I'm, I'm at my desk. I've got my, uh, my microphone set up, and I just, it feels good. I'm excited. 
Um, there will be, you know, monthly bills, utilities. It's it's really not too bad at all. Um, if you want to donate toward just going to pay for for the studio again, it's it's not a tremendous amount. I, I negotiated a really great price. I'm excited. I will decorate. Um, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not interested in spending a lot of money to do some fancy. Um, you know, set design, although I enjoy doing that. Uh, A lot of people don't realize that I worked for 20 years doing uh, decorative painting, artistic and decorative painting, which was essentially in a lot of ways set design um, for commercial and and residential clients and furniture grade cabinet finishes, a lot of these sort of things. So I kind of miss working with my hands and I have an opportunity to to do something like this and just create a nice little ambiance. I'm looking forward to doing that again, you know, within budget, within reason. Um, so over the next few months, you'll probably see a lot of transformations and ideally because I have the space here, um, what I'll probably do is I'll have this, my desk. I may change this so that I can have guests. Um, there's a, there's a simple little, um, reality. I, I, none of you really could care less about this, but I'm interested in this because just the process of filming, by the way, I am the cameraman, I'm the writer, I'm the producer, I'm the editor. I mean, I do all this myself. Initially, when I first started, I had a friend that helped me with the cameras. Um, Nowadays, I do it all myself. Now, on this show, because I'm just getting started, I have one camera. Normally, I'll have a few cameras and I'll edit them together. It's just nice to have uh, something nice to watch and presentable. And long term, what I'd really like to do is actually improve the quality of this little sort of, basically a visual podcast, and possibly get on some Christian networks. Um, that's definitely worth pursuing, and it's something that I may do down the road. Um, there's just so much important stuff out there that's unfolding that I believe the body of Christ needs to be aware of. So please pray uh, toward that. Um, but one of the things in terms of the, just the process, the production process that I'm interested in is, um, this desktop, because it's square, um, it's important that it, the camera is lined up. If you just turn it just the wrong way, everything looks like it's out of whack. And this was actually part of the underground studio because there was bricks that are you know horizontal and so forth. It's very difficult to move the cameras at any angle because everything just looks w- sort of wonky if you don't do it right. So these are little details um, that you have to think about, but what I'll probably do is get a curved desk so that I can have guests. And when you're sitting at a curved desk, it doesn't look strange. If you have just a, a straight desk, then again, every camera has to be lined up just right. And it's just little details like this that uh, they make it, they make the production challenging. So anyway, I'm just talking, I'm dreaming. Some of you could care less. I know some of you are interested. Um, I enjoy sort of the artistic process of just putting together, a, you know, again, a simple little program like this. Okay, um, next update is this is, and I know many people are emailing, asking, and so forth, is the the secret ministry trip, the secret um, archaeological trip that I um, have been talking about since the beginning of the year. It has not happened yet. Um, I'm right now toward the middle, toward the end of March, recording this, and it has not happened yet. Uh, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Now, let me just give you an update. Um, initially, when I first mentioned it to everyone, I was going to go in the middle of January. I mean, I was ready to go, boom, immediately. Um, we could not get our visas in time. It was We were really pushing it to try to even make it happen, but we couldn't get our visas in time. And that's okay, because that was the winter, and it would have been very difficult, because the trip is going to require some sleeping out at night um, in extremely remote, out in the middle of nowhere sort of places. And in the winter, even there, Uh, In the desert, it got cold, really cold at night, below 30, and then it could warm up during the day, but um, that would have been a challenge. Okay, so then we moved it toward uh, the middle of March, about a week ago, it was the next um, time that we were going to go in terms of, we got our visas, by the way, so this was a huge hurdle. We got our visas, so praise God for that. Um, But then the the brother that is going to be our primary guide in all of this, and I don't want to give too many details, but he got in an accident. Um, it was not a car accident. It was an accident. Uh, again, I don't want to give too much details because just I, I, it's important until after we get back that we don't talk about much. But he broke six ribs and punctured his lung. So it was pretty serious because what we have to do is incredibly rigorous. Um, this is not just we're going to you know drive someplace in a car and get out and check out something. This is 
this is going to be incredibly difficult. And, um, you know, p- please pray for me that I'll be in good enough shape even just to be able to pull off what we have to pull off. Um, but again, the brother broke six ribs. And so I thought we're not going to be able to do it, you know, until the fall sort of thing. Uh, but this guy is such a tough cookie. He said, well, this is going to hold me up a few weeks. I said, a few weeks? This is this is a few months' recovery. Um, I read about Rand Paul when he broke his ribs. And, uh, you know, he texted me about it two weeks later, and he goes, they took the tube out, and, you know, I should be good here in a couple of weeks. I'm going, you're kidding me. So he's basically on the mend, and he's doing well. The trip, we've got it all scheduled. It's coming up. I can't tell you when. I, I don't want to publicize this. Um, but it's coming up, and friends, here's why it's a good thing that it's it's gotten delayed um, several times, because I've, I now see that it's the sovereignty of God in all this, although I don't want to say it was God's fault that he got in an accident, but I'm just saying it's a good thing that this thing has been delayed, because it's given me a lot of time to study the subject, to read all kinds of books on the history, to watch videos about this particular uh, location that we're going, and all I can say right now is I am absolutely fascinated. This is this is, uh, it's so much bigger even than what I, you know, because I've been praying for years. I've really been praying for years. Lord, I want to visit this. I want to um, call attention to this particular location. And as I mentioned, there's some new finds, some new issues. And um, I have been in conversation with um, some experts and so forth that all of this will come out. But over the next year or so, um, if we get back successfully, and you know, there's always the chance that a lot of room for warfare between now and then. Um, but if we get back successfully, you know, get all of the evidence and footage and all of these different things, um, I personally just I'm excited about this. I think it's going to be huge. So I, I'm rambling on about something that I can't even tell you what it is, but I am just really excited. But here's the thing, guys: please pray um, for myself and my family. Um, over the next several weeks. As you watch this, please pray for us. The warfare is real. Um, The the spiritual warfare over this issue is legitimate. And we've already overcome a few hurdles, but there are several more to go in order to make make this successful. So please do, please pray for me, pray for my family. There's been tremendous warfare. Now, um, I'm not going to get into all of the other different things. There's just a lot going on. We've got a lot coming up here uh, this year. It's it's a very busy year. Um, I've got a trip coming up to Singapore, and then uh, this summer is the One King uh, tour slash conference with Samuel Whitfield and uh, Stuart Greaves, Jay Thomas, and all many of you have signed up and really looking forward to that. Um, I will mention this just as a first sort of little um, uh, preview. Uh, April 2019, okay, so I'm filming this in March of 2018, so over a year from now, I will be doing a tour to Israel and Jordan, and um, this is already in play. We're planning it. I'll begin advertising very soon. I didn't want to announce it um, until after the One King was filled up and so forth. I'll be talking about this soon, but um, this will be just me. It's not going to be a big conference Um, I'll be leading the tour. Again, we'll be going into Jordan. We'll be going to Petra. We'll be visiting with different ministries. Ideally, I would like to do some ministry, go to visit some of the refugee camps over there in Jordan. And this is something that if all goes well, I'm hoping that I can begin doing uh, a tour like this at least once a year. And I'll actually, uh, this particular tour, I'm partnering with Grace Church, which is in St. Louis, um, an amazing, awesome church, uh, Pastor Ron Tucker. I've actually visited and spoken there a few different times, and I'll actually be visiting again here um, pretty soon in April. And um, Wes Martin, Pastor Wes Martin is the associate pastor there. Um, as far as right now, I'm not sure, you know, but Wes is coming, so it'll be myself and Wes Martin. And um, so in all likelihood, you know, there'll be some from the family of Grace Church coming, but it's wide open, and so I just want to make everyone aware of that. I'm really looking forward to it. As I said, this will probably be the first in a series of tours that I begin doing at least once a year. Long term, what I would love to do is is do something different than just your normal Israel tour. Um, you know, I'd like to go to Israel, but sort of to bring in more than just that. You know, Jordan, maybe eventually someday we can even expand it into Iraq um, to take folks down to Egypt. 
Uh, unfortunately, I can't go into Turkey with all that's unfolding there because I've been critical of the president and the current Islamist government, and I've had friends in intelligence tell me, Joel, you can't even go through the airport. Um, they'll 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 put you in prison and you'll never get out sort of thing. So unfortunately, I would love to do, you know, sort of the missionary journey of Paul and that sort of thing, but it's just, it's just off uh, the table right now. But in any case, um, we'll talk more about that as, as time goes on. Prophetic update. I want to just sort of jump into this issue. There was a, um, an article that ran in Memory, Middle Eastern Media Research Institute, um, a couple weeks ago. A lot of people have been talking about it. So I want to just take a little bit of time to sort of go back and do a Turkey update. What's going on with this revived Ottoman, uh, neo-Ottoman Turkey? Um, I want to talk about this article, and I want to just take a little bit of time to look at the scriptures as usual and just sort of give an update here. So first of all, I just to begin, what I want to do is actually read a couple quotes. This, These are both from my book, Islamic Antichrist. So um, for those that have read my book, Islamic Antichrist, it was initially self-published. I actually self-published it online under the title of Will Islam Be Our Future? I, I put it online in 2004, 2005. Then I self-published it as a paperback, and the title back then was Antichrist, Islam's Awaited Messiah. Um, and then in 2009, so three years later, WorldNet Daily uh, republished it, You know, bought the the rights and republished it as a hardcover. It has since then been re-released as a soft cover. So it's had a few different sort of uh, lives, a few different resurrections, manifestations down through the years. But the point is this, is that I wrote it in 2003, 2004. Um, I finished it. I started writing in 2003, finished it up in 2004. And so it's really, it's almost surreal for me uh, who has written this. And I don't say this as a prophet. Again, I want to be very clear. Um, by simply looking at the words of the prophets, it's amazing how just ordinary people can predict the future. It's not that we predict the future, but the Bible tells us things that are about to take place. And so with that in mind, um, it was in looking at the prophecy of Ezekiel 38-39, the Battle of Gog Magog, that I made a couple statements here, and again, written in 2003-2004, um, that are coming to pass now, here we are, uh, 15, 14, 15 years later, in a profound way. So the first uh, quote is from Islamic Antichrist, page 94. I said, while there is always the temptation to read one's enemies into Scripture, instead, we should simply take the Bible for what it says. In other words, it's not about looking out at the horizon, seeing who is the great enemy of our day, seeing who is the big boogeyman. Rather, we simply need to look at what the prophets say and just simply stick with that. And eventually, world events will line up with what the Bible says. So then I went on, I said, while presently there is not any pressing reason to see Turkey as the leader of an imminent world empire, this is, nevertheless, what Ezekiel prophesied. Again, back in 2003, 2004, Turkey, any news article that you read back then said, oh, the Turks are turning toward the West, they're turning toward Europe, they're becoming more moderate. We were still functioning off of the old paradigm that Turkey is the model that we want to replicate throughout the Middle East. Uh, we want to see other Middle Eastern nations follow the pattern of Turkey. There was no indicators that Turkey was turning toward a hard nationalist or Islamist or a bent toward a dictatorship. There was no evidence of that. I said, but nevertheless, that is what the prophet Ezekiel said. Uh, the next statement is from page 98. I said, the Turkish Empire was the seat of the Islamic Caliphate. That was the Ottoman Empire, was the Ottoman Caliphate. The Caliphate being the Islamic government, uh, legal, military, and religious, all wrapped up under one headship of the Caliph or the Caliph, uh, and the government itself is called the Caliphate. So it was not until 1923 that the Islamic Caliphate was officially abolished. That's when the fatal head wound took place. Now, again, I'm not saying the Antichrist himself won't suffer some kind of fatal head wound, but the point is that it's king, kingdom, emperor, empire. And so in the same way that the Antichrist as an individual may personally suffer a head wound and come back, likewise the empire itself, the beast, um, would suffer the head wound. And the, the most recent anti-Christic empire that really existed for 1,500 years, 
1400 years, um, was the Islamic Caliphate, and it culminated with the Ottoman Empire. So uh, I went on, I said, the Bible teaches that someday soon the Turkish Empire would be revived. Now again, I want to just make this clear. I didn't say that as a prophet. God didn't show that to me in a dream or a vision. An angel didn't speak to me. I've never made any such claims. Rather, simply by reading the Word of God, I said, this is what the Scriptures say. Ezekiel is pointing toward a Turkish-led Islamic coalition, an Islamic invasion that would also be a revival of a previous empire. And that empire, of course, being essentially the Ottoman Empire, the Islamic Caliphate. It's much bigger than just the Ottoman Empire, but that's how it culminated. So in the same way that you could point to, for instance, uh, Roman dynasties, the Julian dynasty, the uh, Augustin, uh, Augustinian dynasty, the different dynasties, different parts of the Roman Empire. It's all the Roman Empire. Well, likewise, the Ottoman Empire is really just part of the larger historical Islamic caliphate. As I said, 13, 1400 years is, is accurate. So briefly, I want to just look at a little historical backdrop for the prophecy of Ezekiel 38, 39. First of all, the thing that's interesting about this passage is that it's such a huge, looming monster of a prophecy in the Old Testament. I mean, it's such a foundational, important uh, prophecy, oracle, if we want to understand what the New Testament is speaking. The problem with it is that for the first several hundred years of the Church, we don't have a tremendous amount of information in terms of commentaries or writings on this. Not nearly as much, for instance, as we have on the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel, or the book of Revelation. We have a lot, really, even in the early years from some of the early Church writers and so on and so forth. We don't have nearly as much with regard to Ezekiel. Now, obviously, Christians have written much about this, Christians and Jews, uh, down through history, but there's just not as much information in that sort of first first millennium uh, after Christ. But when we look at the Talmud, uh, specifically, we see an articulation of the, the Jewish perspective regarding this passage. And the Jewish perspective from the very beginning is that Ezekiel 38-39, the battle of Gog-Magog, that Gog is essentially what we would call as Christians the Antichrist. Gog is the final, ultimate enemy of Israel that God will destroy right before the Messiah returns in the age of the Messiah. So from Targum, Pseudo-Jonathan, um, on Numbers 11, verse 26, this is again from the Talmud, is this statement. It, again, it articulates the Jewish, earliest Jewish perspective on Gog Magog, really probably the oldest clear um, testimony that we have from either Jewish or Christian sources other than um, some intertestamental, that sort of apocalyptic stuff. We won't get into that uh, during this program. But it says this, Behold, a king shall come up from the land of Magog at the end of days. Ha'achrit uh, hayomim. This is sort of a classic Hebrew uh, phrase throughout the prophets. It's the latter days, the end days, the hind quarter of the days, at the end of days. He shall assemble kings. Again, so... A king comes up from the land of Magog, that's Gog. He will assemble kings, skipping forward, and the nations shall obey him. The Gentiles will obey him. They shall array for battle in the land of Israel, but the Lord shall be ready for them. Their dead bodies shall fall upon the mountains of the land of Israel. The wild beasts of the field, the birds of heaven shall come and consume them. After that, all of the dead of Israel shall be resurrected and shall enjoy the good things which were secretly set aside for them from the beginning, and they shall receive the reward of their labor. So you have the destruction of Gog, who is the leader of this last day's uh, invasion of Israel, and then he is destroyed. This is the judgment of God against the Gentiles, and then you have the resurrection of the dead. So you begin there. Um, then skipping forward, and this is probably the first clearest Christian testimony that we have, um, again, beyond the intertestamental li literature, um, Nicholas of Lyra. Now, this is uh, Nicholas of Lyra is an important guy. He wrote in the 13th, 14th century. He was probably the, the strongest um, Hebrew scholar of that, uh, that period, of that century. He was a... Um, Medieval Hebrew scholar, just renowned biblical exegete, 
Um, he believed that Gog was another title for the Antichrist. And this is, uh, this is important because the earliest Christian exegete... Now, Lyra was cited extensively by the Reformers who came along just, you know, again, 150 years later, they're, they're popping and they're citing Nicholas of Lyra. He was a very important figure from that period. He believed that Gog was simply another name for the Antichrist. This is what I've been teaching for years. Again, in my book, Mideast Beast, uh, and just in so many other teachings, I'm like, look, Ezekiel is telling the same story as all of the other prophets. Lear also affirmed that Islam, which he referred to as the religion of the Turks. So the Turks, of course, are creeping up into Europe, and so most often when the European Christian writers were speaking of Islam, they just referred to the Turks. When they referred to the Muslims, they just referred to the Turks. When they referred to Islam, they would just say the religion of the Turks, um, because that's what they were acquainted with, and he believed that Islam was the religion of the Antichrist. Okay, so he believed that Gog was the Antichrist, and he believed that Islam was the religion of the Antichrist. Again, pro- most prominent Hebrew scholar and biblical exegete of the 13th and 14th century um, affirmed that which I have been affirming um, for the past 15 years or so publicly. And, you know, again, it's this is important because you have so many people that go, Joel, your perspective is new, it's different. No, that's an incredibly myopic perspective. If we're reading just books that have been put out by popular prophecy authors, Uh, over the past hundred years, then yes, the idea that Islam is the religion of the Antichrist is a minority view, but in terms of church history, it's by no means a new perspective. In fact, with regard to Gog, it's actually the earliest perspective. Um, And then this is interesting, John Mayer, who's a very well-known reformer, um, he was referring back to Lyra's view, uh, which again is Gog is the Antichrist, and he went on to say that it is the most generally received view among the reformers. So even among the reformers, they believe that Gog was the Antichrist, again, uh, reflecting Lyra's perspective. Now, we could do a whole show where I just cite endless exegetes, different folks uh, down through history that have affirmed this, that agree with uh, what I've been saying, which is that Ezekiel is simply talking about the Antichrist. Gog is simply another name for the Antichrist. But there's just a few names that I'll throw out there because it's interesting, it's fun, um, and again, just to see that my perspective is by no means something new. John Nelson Darby. Um, I'm not a big fan, um, you know, but he is definitely a looming figure within the Bible prophecy community today. He's the father of modern dispensationalism. Uh, And in his synopsis of the books of the Bible, he explains that Gog represents the forces of the Antichrist. Here's what he says. He says, Gog is the end of all the dealings of God with respect to Israel. God brings up this haughty power in order to manifest on earth by a final judgment his dealings with Israel and with the Gentiles. Uh, C.I. Schofield, again, sort of a student of Darby, who then sort of took Darby's perspective with regard to dispensationalism, pre-tribulational rapture, and so forth, and really spread it all over the United States. Again, a, uh, I'm not a, a huge fan. Um, I mean, he's not among my favorites from that period, um, but he's a looming figure within the prophecy community. He viewed Ezekiel 38-39 as none other than the Battle of Armageddon. Um, he says this, that destruction should fall at the climax of the last mad attempt to exterminate the remnant of Israel in Jerusalem. So Ezekiel 38, 39, he said, it is the last mad attempt by the devil to exterminate the remnant of Israel. He goes on and he says, the whole prophecy belongs to the yet future day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord, and to the battle of Armageddon. So Darby, Schofield, again, going back... Um, Skipping forward, uh, Charles Lee Feinberg, um, a prominent Messianic Jewish expositor, again, a dispensationalist. Um, He wrote a great commentary on Ezekiel. Um, He says this, the armies of chapters 38 and 39 would appear to be included in the universal confederacies seen in Zechariah 12 and 14. So Feinberg says that these prophecies concerning the Antichrist, Zechariah 12 and 14, which everyone acknowledges that's the Antichrist. He goes, that's the same thing as the Confederacy in Ezekiel 38, 39. 
Uh, and then I'm just going to share some maps. I've shared these in some different programs, but it's always good to pull these out. Um, the New Moody Atlas of the Bible, where does it place? Magog, Meshach, Gomer, Tubal, Togorma. It places them all in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Again, if we look at all sorts of different maps from prophecy books, they're going to put them up in Russia. Um, it almost doesn't matter who we're talking about from the more popular dispensational camps. They just tend to sort of reflect previous prophecy books that they've read. Their teachers say this, and they all have different maps, but almost always they're placed in Russia. Sometimes they place them in Europe. But when we look at the Bible atlases, they don't have a prophetic bone to pick. They always place Magog, Gomer, Meshach, Tagorma, where? In Asia Minor. So that's the New Moody Atlas of the Bible. Likewise, the Zondervan Atlas of the Bible uh, places them all in Asia Minor, along with Lud, which is Lydia. Um, Holman Bible Atlas, uh, the same thing pertains to the IVP, Atlas of Bible History. Uh, we could be a lot more extensive. Others will sort of um, pull Togorma uh, and sometimes Gomer out a little bit more into what we would call today Armenia, Azerbaijan, that's slightly east of modern-day Turkey, but the area that was previously held by the Ottomans. Um, so it's just important to emphasize the fact that when we're not adhering to some particular prophetic tradition, but we're simply reading the guys who are just saying, these are the locations according to uh, the best evidence of history, Ezekiel was pointing to Turkey. Turkey as the region from which the Antichrist would come. Now, we're not going to lay out all of the scriptural reasons why Ezekiel is speaking of the Antichrist. I've done that many other times, and I'll probably come back and do it again. I just want to jump in and look at this article um, that was highlighted by memory. Now, again, Middle Eastern Media, M-E-M-R-I, Middle Eastern Media Research Institute. Now, the article that it's referring to was actually published in a very prominent Turkish newspaper called Yeni Shafak. Uh, just me, it translates as the new dawn. Yeni is new, Shafak is dawn. Um, it's like the S with a little sort of umlaut, little thing under it, which in Turkish is, is like a, a, a SH. Okay, so we're all familiar, of course, with President Erdogan. I've talked extensively about him multiple times. He is the emerging dictator of Turkey. He's been in power since 2002. Um, I have referred to him as the emerging Adolf Hitler of the Middle East. He is clearly, at the very least, let's put it this way, he is clearly the Ayatollah Khomeini of Turkey. He is the Islamist uh, dictator that has emerged that is turning Turkey into an Islamist dictatorship. Now, he's very different than uh, Khomeini in that Khomeini was really establishing an Islamic revolution. The entire thing was Islamic, um, and they, they wanted to expand the Iranian Islamic revolution throughout the Islamic world. In Erdogan's case, it's much more of a Turkish nationalism, and he's using Islamism in a lot of ways, in my opinion, to to prop up his Turkish nationalism. It it's really is about this revived Ottoman uh, sort of mentality that the Turks are those who are divinely destined to lead the whole Islamic world. Now, again, a lot of the Arabs don't want that. They don't have fond memories of being dominated by the Turks. But the argument is essentially being made that the reason the Middle East is such a mess uh, is because of the Western colonizing powers. You know, we look at Syria, Iraq, it's a nightmare. And um, in not just Iraq and Syria, but there's just so much in Yemen. And the reason the whole Middle East is a mess is because the Ottoman Empire was dissolved. That if we would return to an Islamic caliphate, that once again, order and um, so forth could be restored toward the Middle East. This is essentially the argument that's being made. Um, and this is just coinciding with this incredible Turkish nationalism that is emerging. That nationalism is blowing up in different parts of the world right now. It's It, it really is like... Uh, you know, Nazi Germany, we're seeing that emerge, that same spirit emerge in Turkey right now. It's incredibly dangerous. So to the article in Yeni Shafak, why is this so important? Well, again, it was published in December. It was just highlighted recently by memory, uh, Middle Eastern Media Research Institute. And the, the point, the, one of the points that's so critical is that the fellow who wrote the article, it was an opinion piece. His name is Adnan Tanriverdi. Um, he is a military strategist and advisor to President Erdogan in Turkey. 
Okay, so that is incredibly significant. This is not just some random guy writing an opinion piece in the New York Times or the you know, LA Times or something like this. This is a guy who actually has the ear of the president. He has been chosen by the president to be a military advisor. And in that article, let's talk about some of these uh, things that are suggested. Uh, the title, um, it had two different titles. There's the online version, and then there was a, another, um, the publication um, used the title, What If an Army of Islam Was Formed Against Israel? Now, let me just repeat that. What if an army of Islam was formed against Israel? So he talks about this idea of forming an Islamic army, a unified coalition. That's exactly what Ezekiel, that's exactly what Joel, that's exactly what Zechariah, that's exactly what so many others of the prophets were talking about, but specifically against Israel. And that's why it's so critical, because here you have an unbeliever, um, again, a military advisor um, who's advising one of the most important leaders in the Middle East, who is essentially articulating exactly what the biblical prophets said we will see in the last days. The article actually calls on the 57 member states of the OIC, that's the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, of which Erdogan is currently the head, by the way, is the leader of the OIC. So here you have Turkey leading the 57 uh, member states of the OIC, and it calls on them to form a joint, quote, army of Islam, an Islamic army. And again, this is not just North Africa and the Middle East. This is, we're talking all the way over to Indonesia, Malaysia, I mean, the entire Islamic world joining their armies together. For, for what? For the purpose of attacking Israel. I mean, we, we have to take note of this. It uh, specifically notes that such a joint army will be greatly uh, more powerful. It will be significantly more powerful than the Israeli army in terms of manpower, in terms of equipment, in terms of budget, in terms of... I mean, he, he just goes through multiple statistics, and he goes, look, he's, he says even Turkey by itself has a much larger army, and he gets into statistics, and this is really from a military, uh, you know, strategic perspective, this is really true. Israel is a small nation. We need to remember this. The United States, you know, such a, a vast... Um, piece of property with so many different cities, you could you could literally eliminate a handful of cities in the United States with nuclear warheads, and the overwhelming majority of the country would be essentially unscathed. Um, the nation of Israel is such a, a small piece of property, relatively speaking. And you look at the city of Tel Aviv, over half of the Jewish population of the entire country lives in that one city. And it would be very easy if you had enough manpower coming against Israel um, to do significant damage uh, to the nation and possibly, you know, actually take them out. So we need to understand this is, this is um, you know, I know a lot of people listening will be like, no, the Bible says God's going to protect Israel forever. We won't get into all of that in terms of what the scriptures actually do say, because the scriptures are very clear that the time of Jacob's trouble is still coming, is yet future. I mean, there, there are very dark days ahead for the current state of Israel. That's not the, perp- that's not the topic of this show. Um, but we, we need to realize that when threats like this are made, when uh, things like this are made, these are legitimate dangers. Uh, the article goes on to describe Israel as the outpost of the new crusade, or the new crusaders, and they dagger in the heart of Islam. It also calls Israel the eyes, the ears, and the fist of the Christian world. So it sees this sort of unity between the Christian world and Israel. Israel is this outpost of the Western infidel world there in the Middle East. And it's just amazing that the prophets declared that in the last days all the nations would be turned against Israel. And today in our time, we have people who have no connection to the Bible, who have no, they're not getting their ideas from the Bible. This is not some Christian fulfilling prophecy because he wants to see, you know, self-fulfilled prophecy. This is someone detached from the testimony of the biblical prophets who is calling for the testimony of the biblical prophets to be fulfilled. Uh, I mean, this is really profound. Another article written by Tan Riverdi is titled, Palestine too should have an army. And in that, he articulates his vision of forming a Palestinian army equipped with tanks, heavy weaponry, and then he goes on and he adds that the army of Islam would support this Palestinian army. So again, combine you know an army right there um, of anti-Israel sentiment essentially surrounding Israel, all around Israel, and then have 57 Islamic nations backing them up and giving them weapons of a proper military. I mean, that would be... that. 
this is one of the reasons why a two-state solution is not feasible, because if Israel um, allowed the Palestinian people to form a Palestine, then they would have every sort of legal right to have all of the weapons of any normal military. And if, as long as their goal is to wipe out Israel as a, as a, as a people, drive them into the sea, it's just, it's not even tenable. It's not even a question. Now, here is um, a point that I haven't seen a lot of folks highlight, is that Tan Reverdy um, specifically quotes, he cites, he paraphrases from the Hadith of the Garkhard tree. Now, the Garkhard tree is, is this infamous Hadith, which, uh, I mean, many of you are familiar with it, but it says, the day of resurrection, this is allegedly a prophecy made by Muhammad, the day of resurrection will not come until the Muslims fight against the Jews and kill them, until there are only a few Jews left hiding themselves behind a tree or a rock, and then the tree or the rock would cry out and say, oh, faithful Muslim, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. So here you have, again, the Bible makes it clear that before the return of the Messiah, there would be this mad effort, uh, you know, again, to quote the, the Talmud, the last mad attempt to exterminate the people of Israel. This is what the prophets declare would happen. And then here you have the very people that goes all the way back to Genesis, you know, the spiritual Ishmaelites, the spiritual Edomites, who are contending with the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, of Isaac and Jacob, and the children of Israel, to wipe them out, to fulfill the words of the biblical prophets based on a false demonic prophecy. And again, I don't know the history of the Hadith of the Garkar tree, exactly where it came from, but the point is this. Much of the Islamic world believes this, expects to be part of fulfilling this, and they are playing directly into the hands of the devil, who in a weird way is playing into the hands of God to fulfill biblical prophecy. I mean, this is, you can't, you can't, um, you know, again, this is not self-fulfilled prophecy. You can't orchestrate this. So the, the fact that, you know, military analysts or even analysts, uh, geopolitical analysts, um, or even analysts of Islamic apocalyptic movements within Islam, such as Dr. Timothy Furnish, um, this was not something that a lot of people were expecting to see. What I, what I mean is, yes, we're seeing this dictatorship emerge in Turkey, um, we're seeing a lot of nationalism emerge in Turkey, but we haven't seen a tremendous amount from the top of Islamic apocalyptic traditions being cited. We know, you know, ISIS has been doing it. We know that Al-Qaeda has been doing it. We know that the Taliban has been doing it. A lot of these jihadi, these Arab, Sunni, Salafi, Wahhabi groups, we know they're citing the Islamic prophecies. They believe they're part of these end time groups. We know that the Iranian regime, the Ayatollahs and the Mullahs, that they believe they're all part of Islamic end time prophecy. But we haven't seen a tremendous amount of this coming out of the Turkish leadership. Now, we have seen it a lot in Turkey. In fact, Mahdiism is huge in Turkey. It's one of the highest nations in terms of people who believe that the Mahdi would return in their lifetime. Very high um, Islamic messianic expectation. Uh, Adnan Oktar, who wrote under the, the pseudonym um, Harun Yahya, I've met with him a few times in Turkey. He's written extensively on this, but we haven't seen that language with regard to the president. And so, you know, that's significant. Now, I just want to put up this uh, map that was included in the Yeni Shafak article. You look at this map, you see all these Islamic nations highlighted in green, and it's sort of laying out this invasion of Israel. Friends, when you look at this map, it looks like it was written by a Christian apocalyptic writer such as myself, or someone, you know, perhaps even a little more sensationalized. This is the type of thing that we're used to seeing in Christian prophecy books. This was not written by a Christian. This was not put together by a Christian. This was put together by a military strategist in one of the most powerful nations in the Middle East. Again, Turkey has the largest army in the whole Middle East and a very powerful military. You know, one of the things that Tan Reverdy uh, cites is he goes, look, Israel's got like 8 million people. And that's, you know, again, Arabs, uh, Christians, Jews, everything, eight, 8 million or so. He goes, we've got over 12 million just, or 12 or 14, just in Istanbul alone. Turkey has 72 million. He goes, look, in terms of manpower, we can overpower them. And so to me, this is, I look at this map and I go, yes, Lord, you know, your word is true. These things are being fulfilled in our day. Um, here's a couple quotes from Erdogan in just recent months. 
He says, now, again, this is the idea of an expansionist of an empire being revived, again, which is what I said, reading Ezekiel's prophecy all the way back, the quotes that I read from Islamic Antichrist. In the days ahead, we're going to see a revived Turkish empire, this neo-Ottoman expansionism, where the Republic of Turkey, as it's existed as a nation for the past 80 years, that's not enough. They want to return to their former Ottoman empire borders. So here's a statement from Neverdewan. He says, those who thought we've forgotten about all these lands, he's ta- in this quote he's talking about Iraq, after withdrawing in tears a century ago, better realize now that they are wrong about Turkey. Okay, so this is not some polemicist, this is not some right, somebody writing an op-ed piece in some newspaper. This is the president of the country saying, if they thought we forgot about all these lands that we abandoned 100 years ago, they're wrong. He says this, and this is just a few weeks ago. He said, we say at every opportunity we have that Syria, Iraq, and other places on the map are no different from our own homeland. We are struggling. Now listen to this. We are struggling. Jihad. We are fighting so that a foreign flag will not be waved anywhere where the azan, that's the Islamic call to prayer, is recited. So he goes, look, wherever Islam is being practiced, wherever there are mosques, wherever the call to prayer goes off, he goes, we are fighting until there's not a single foreign flag in any of those places. In other words, he's openly now, openly declaring his neo-Ottoman intentions, his intention to lead a revived Ottoman Empire. Here's a couple more statements. He said, the Turks have sacrificed a lot in the last two centuries. Five million square kilometer territory under Ottoman rule under Ottoman rule was plundered through deceit, plots, and reduced to a mere eight hundred and seventy thousand square kilometers. Again, so he goes over five million kilometers were reduced to less than one million square kilometers. And then he said this the sleeping giant has now been awakened. Again, that's the president of Turkey. The sleeping giant has now been awakened, and he's using the language of returning to the former territories. This is, this is Nazi-like. This is Nazi-like in so many ways. Uh, March 9th, this was, at the time of this recording, this was a little over a week ago. He said, we are marching toward the secure city, which in Islam, that means Mecca. That's what Mecca is referred to, the, the, the secure city. He said, we are marching toward Mecca with God's permission, with Allah's permission. So he, he's stating right out. You know, again, Mecca and Medina, this is the, the, um, the Hejaz region of Saudi Arabia. That was formerly controlled by the Turks, by the Ottomans. And so the, the, the Turks have long looked at the Saudis and said, eventually we're going to get that back because that's ours, that belongs to us. He openly declared, we are marching toward Mecca. This is, he's talking about a, an invasion of Saudi Arabia. Um, for those that have read my book, Mystery Babylon, you know that I believe that eventually the beast, which I believe is led by Turkey, will turn on the harlot, which I believe is the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the city of Mecca. I mean, here you have the president of Turkey essentially uh, you know, reading his uh, lines almost right out of my stuff, not because it's mine, but because I'm simply citing the biblical prophets. This is significant. Um, Here's another statement that ties in um, Islamic apocalyptic sort of end-time views with this Turkish nationalism. This was a statement by Yassin Akte. Now, he's a, he's a lawmaker, but he's a senior member of the AKP party in Turkey. So here's the, again, he's not just a no one, but he said this. He said, Turkey is the acting leader of the caliphate, while the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Ikhwan, not just in Egypt, but all over the Middle East, and Jamaat al Islamiyah, they're primarily operating over in like Pakistan and India and so forth, are part of Turkey's soft powers. So he goes, these Islamist groups, they're part of our soft powers. He goes, but we are the leaders of the caliphate. Um, So it's just, you know, sort of all of these things coming together. Um, There was another article just a few weeks ago that referred to General Erdogan's first war. He's talking about the invasion of Afrin, again, which is Syria. This is a foreign invasion. Turkey expanding its borders, attacking the Kurds, the primary people, by the way, who fought off ISIS, American allies, and we're just standing back and letting it happen. Uh, And in this article by Stephen Cook, this was February 7th, he basically argues that 
Erdogan's involvement in the military activities of the Turkish army is the most significant Turkish civilian involvement in Turkey's military, I mean, ever, you know, because he's not a general, but he's functioning as a general. Why? Because a, a caliph functions not just as a, um, a, a legal leader, uh, leader, you know, in terms of... Uh, in terms of legislation and in terms of the judiciary, but rather as, again, religious, political, and military. That's what the caliph is, is pope, president, and general all wrapped up into one office. So here's the president acting like the general. So just to uh, summarize and wrap this up and, uh, and complete this, this program, uh, really everything that the biblical prophets laid out they are all falling into alignment uh, in a very profound way. Am I saying that Erdogan is the Antichrist? No, I'm not saying that at all. Um, again, I believe that it's quite likely that he is uh, he's an excellent forerunner to the Antichrist. He's an excellent precursor to the Antichrist. Um, but I believe he may be a prominent prophetic figure, um, but not the Antichrist. I believe someone else is coming. I could be wrong. You know, sort of in terms of Antichrist candidates, he's, a, he's an excellent candidate. Um, but as I've talked about before, I believe that Daniel 8 tells us that there is a massive Iranian war that will be followed by a Turkish response. And it's sort of out of the ashes of these, um, these couple of wars that we will see the Antichrist emerge. But in the meantime, the signs are falling into place. Uh, significant, significant things are developing in our day. And we need to be aware, we need to be alert, we need to be paying attention, but most of all, we need to be giving ourselves to sharing the gospel, completing the Great Commission, giving ourselves to holiness and prayer, and awaiting the return of the King. So, uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up for this week. Um, again, thank you so much. Just everybody, thank you so much for your prayers, for all of your support. It really means the world. I'm so excited to be back here in the studio, and I look forward to uh, getting busy. I really, I'm going to start being very deliberate about trying to record regularly, to do all kinds of teaching, to release all sorts of new books and DVDs and different things over the next year. I've got so much that I want to talk about, and it's a blessing to be able to have some space, some dedicated workspace to really be productive. So again, please keep myself and my family in prayer, and I'll look forward to seeing you real soon. Until next week, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground.